Hey, Kobe, how are you? Hi, fabulous. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so excited to have you on to chat about your book, The Poison Path Herbal. This isn't a topic I expected to have on the podcast, but as soon as I saw the book, I'm like, oh my God, this is so interesting. This is so fun because there is so much negativity around poisonous herbs and plants. And I love the positive approach you bring to it. So I want to get started and talk all about it. But before we do so, I want to hear a little bit about your journey. What has been your journey? discovering and working with the magic of poisonous herbs and herbs in general. Yeah, I've been interested in plants and herbs since a really young age. Um, I grew up in the garden with my grandparents, planting, growing flowers, vegetables. And um, I remember my grandparents had these um, sort of natural medicine books on just different herbal cures and things like that. And for whatever reason, just knowing um what the different plants were capable of doing in the human body was something that was really fascinating to me, like even you know, in elementary school before I was a teenager and all that. So always kind of drew me in. Uh, poisonous plants came a little bit later, probably my early 20s. Um, yeah, there's it's just something about poison in general, looking back, that's always kind of caught my attention and has popped up in, in different books and movies and things. Yeah. yeah. Now, when thinking about poisonous herbs and plants, we don't necessarily start thinking about, oh, they can be healing and we can work with them for like healing purposes or spiritual purposes. But that's what you teach in this book. So can you, can you share a little bit about like demystify the dangers and not dangers of poisonous herbs and plants when it comes to working with them for healing or spirituality and mysticism. Yeah, so that has kind of been a big part of my work, you know, even even just just recently over the past couple of years, it was, um, you know, poison is is very kind of attractive and seductive and mysterious in a lot of ways and kind of draws you in. And then when you do sort of take a closer look, you kind of quickly realize that poison is kind of this blanket term that encompasses all of these different plants and fungi and, and concepts, even, you know, outside of the, the phytochemical realm and looking at what the plants are, are physically capable of, but just looking at um, poison as, as sort of this occult concept or almost like an energy that certain things kind of exude that has a really dramatic effect on um, other things when it comes into contact with them. So just sort of understanding um, and dispelling a lot of the fears surrounding it. Um, because what I say all of the time to people when I'm teaching different classes is that it's the very same chemicals and compounds that make a plant poisonous that also make it medicinal. Ooh, I love that. That's a great quotable thing to share, by the way. Now let's <laughs> talk about this. How, so I guess the, the chemistry of it can be poisonous like physically, but I like the fact that you talk about the energetic component as well. Sometimes I remember, because I work a lot with flower essences, and I'm on a monthly subscription and every single month I work with a different flower. And I remember we worked with the sacred Datura flower, which is a very poisonous flower. But when you take it as an elixir, you take the essence of it. It's a homeopathic remedy. So there's nothing of the chemistry of the plant in there. And what it did is it basically escalated um, a dark night of the soul, <laughs> allowing you to see certain things that were suppressed, but already within the energetic field, so you can heal and move on with them. So I guess that poison aspect of sacred datura worked in that spiritual and energetic way, as well as the the the, the physical way, which would be taking that herb, uh, which is like uh, incredibly poisonous. So can you talk a little bit about the distinction between this energetic poison, quote unquote poison? and the actual like chemical poison of herbs and plants? So the, the chemical poisons, uh, it's gonna vary from plant to plant, but so essentially in, in medicinal herbalism, these would be low dose herbs. So there are plants that have a very dramatic effect on the human organism, you know, straight across the board, they're going to affect all people in a relatively similar way. 
um, and at very sort of minute doses can have these potentially you know, very dramatic and sometimes deadly effects. Um, so people that that don't know what they're doing or or accidental poisonings and things like that, just sort of throughout history, as we've come to understand, you know, how to work better with some of these herbal medicines, um, the understanding kind of makes them less poisonous. So there's yes. very much like a, a human element to how we're working with them and how we're approaching them. Um, and same thing with their energetics. So poisonous plants tend to get this air about them of, of being sinister and malefic and you know connected to all of these dark and scary things. Um, but in reality, they are just plants, just like any other plant. Um, and when we talk about their sort of spiritual properties, they almost act as a, a mirror and kind of reflect back some of the, the dark or shadow aspects of ourself that we need to work through, either through fears or, or different blockages or just kind of looking at you know, why are we uncomfortable by this particular plant when, you know, we're really attracted and drawn into another one? And that can kind of tell us a lot about ourselves based on the, the different types of plant allies that we're attracted to. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the users of, of poisonous plants. What are the possibilities there, both physical, herbal, medicinal, medicinal, but also like spiritual and energetic? Yeah, so just kind of starting on the energetic level, working with things like flower essences, ritual formulas, um, so topical application and, and using formulas in a more magical way, um, a more spiritual way, those are going to connect to kind of the energy of poison in general, uh, which is all about sort of transmutation and transformation. Um, you know, they each sort of have their own energetic signature to them, but just kind of in general, they tap into this more primal aspect of, of ourselves. Uh, medicinally, many of them are used in traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, mm -hmm. um, in a lot of cases. Um, so it's really just a, about how they're prepared and how they're applied. Um, over here in the U.S., we have a lot of stories kind of surrounding the Datura plant because it's one of the ones that are sort of most prevalent in, in North and South America. Um, and you always hear stories of, of people eating the plant and poisoning themselves and, and going on these really uncomfortable trips for, you know, two or three days where they're essentially in like a, a self-induced psychosis. Yes. Um, so very dramatic. Um, Kind of things like that but uh, that's really you know circumstantial people kind of seeking more of a, a recreational use outside of the the context of um you know plant medicine ceremony and and different traditional cultures that have been working with them in that way and know how to prepare them and you know approach the plant spirit with respect and and avoid a lot of those more dangerous kind of scenarios yeah, speaking about the dangers and and like overdosing on like poisonous herbs, what are some safety precautions we should have in mind before and while and like getting into this path of like learning about and using poisonous herbs? Oh, well, part of the poison path and the practice of, of working with plants like this is sort of starting at the very beginning and establishing kind of a, a personal threshold for yourself. Um, and working your way up. Uh, so that could be as, as something as minimal as just coming in contact with the plant briefly out in the wild, sitting with it, um, you know, maybe smelling the flowers or something like that. Um, you know, that first initial contact is, is often a, a pretty transformative experience because we have this idea that, you know, it's a, a poisonous plant and even like the slightest touch is going to have these really intense, you know, deleterious effects. But in a lot of cases, uh, it's not, not necessarily the case. You have to get in there a little bit more and almost <laughs> try and, and cause yourself harm or, or act in kind of a, a reckless way to you to really get into some of these situations that are, are difficult to get out of. Yeah, and I suppose like many plants can be poisonous to different degrees. We just know of the famous ones because they're famous through like movies and TV series. But I remember 
I, I have this little garden in my in my veranda and I had this app that I used to like scan the plants and find out information about them. And there was that toxicity level. And many of the plants that, that we have in our houses, they're like toxic <laughs> to some degree, mm -hmm. like poisonous, but it's yep. maybe like to a small degree. But in the same way, you wouldn't go out and eat like your, your flowers in your pots. You wouldn't go and eat like poisonous plants out in nature as well. I think just, just people want to meddle sometimes with, uh, with poisonous plants just for the sake of it. Or because, as you said, of the stories of how, for example, the Datura flower can get you into like a heightened state of consciousness, which is really psychosis. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and just now, sort of understanding that too, like that. Um, there are, are there are all sorts of different ways that plants can be poisonous and it's kind of become this blanket term you know it could be something that causes a, a rash or a stomach ache or it could be something that causes like coma paralysis and and ultimately yeah. death so it's a really wide kind of spectrum that we use this term for and in the book you talk about different uh, types of plants specifically i can see the book of venus here the book of saturn the book of mercury can you talk about those categories? I find them very interesting because I'm a Greek pagan. So I work with the Greek gods and goddesses. So mm -hmm. I was excited to see Mercury and Venus over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of use the planets as just a, a really simple and accessible way to represent these different categories. And so when I wrote the book initially, I was very much um, sort of entrenched in, in paganism and traditional witchcraft or European witchcraft of the Middle Ages and um, going to the witch's Sabbath and things like that. So I, um, I took an interest in the nightshade family in particular, as well as things like poison hemlock, wolfsbane, uh, and just reading about some of the, the folklore and different uh, magical correspondence and things that were already out there, I started to notice these kind of patterns in themes that would come up. Um, so broke those down into Saturn being some of the, the darker, malefic, more baneful workings. Mercury is more of a traveler, expanded consciousness, visiting other worlds, um, communicating with the dead. Um, and then Venus uh, represents sort of the aphrodisiac aspects that a lot of the plants have. Um, but then also has sort of that dualistic side that we see in the the witch goddess being sort of both beautiful and light and associated with nature, but then on the other side kind of being connected to the the more primal, um, deathly aspects of the the witch queen and and the witch goddess. I'm loving the the, the <laughs> polarity there and the duality of like how we can work with these plants in so many different ways. I, I'm interested about like the aphrodisiac qualities. Can we use poisonous plants safely for sex, either in energetic or physical ways? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so they've been used historically in some uh, rather unethical ways when we go back really, really far in history and see these love potions or, or pocula amatoria that were you know, sometimes used on people that were not aware that they were being used on them. Um, yeah. But kind of carrying it a little bit further, uh, we see henbane, for example, being used in aphrodisiac massage oils uh, for relaxation, lowering inhibitions, and then mandrake would probably be the biggest one, um, just because of its association with fertility and love magic. And, um, you know, so even on a microdose, they have this amorous effect, bringing out those Venusian energies, which is is kind of in contrast when we think of them as uh, being these dark Saturnian herbs. Uh, but sex in and of itself is kind of the other side of death. So it's not, you know, a wow. surprise that they kind of contain both. <laughs> I love that. I love that correlation. Okay, let's talk. I, I love what I love about the book is that you include symbolism, you include astrology, you talk about the plant spirits and how we can work with plants in such a wide diversity of ways. You have uh, glyphs in the book as well, representing different herbs. Can you talk a little bit about why you wanted to bring in all these different aspects of the herbs and how we can start thinking about plants and herbs? in that way as well, not just about the physical aspect of them, but their symbolism, their, their folklore, the astrology behind them as well. 
Yeah, so I kind of consider all of the existent um, folklore and magical correspondences that have been written about and sort of widely circulated as our um, kind of a, a current like vocabulary that we have that we can draw from to make all of these uh, new inferences when it comes to kind of building our own symbol sets and um, associations with these plant allies because they they uh, align with a lot of different spirits and energies and, and things like that that might not be, you know, directly traceable to some kind of historical association or, or something that has been documented. Uh, so through understanding their stories, their myths, their folklore, uh, we can connect it to things that are meaningful to us. Um, and with the, the plant spirit glyphs, that was kind of a way to provide a means for people that were not necessarily going to be growing the plants or coming into contact with live plant material because they're not, you know, necessarily accessible that easily all over the place. And in a lot of cases, they're kind of tricky to grow. So with the plant glyphs, uh, it's a, a process, just a basic sigil making process, essentially, where you kind of sit in meditation with the the plant spirit, uh, so visualizing the way that it looks, thinking about its mythology, its story, uh, its chemistry, and then sort of breaking down the the Latin name is what I use to create mine, um, breaking those letters down and then creating um, an actual glyph out of it to I tap into. I love that. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. And I mean, it's so powerful just connecting with the plant spirit. Whenever I make my own flower essences, my favorite aspect, just waking up like at the crack of dawn, sitting with a, with a plant or herb, meditating, and you can get so much healing and knowledge from the herb just by sitting next to it and meditating. And I never thought I would get so much out of it until I actually did it. And it was such a powerful way without even having an interaction with the plant necessarily, just meditating on it. So these are powerful tools that you're sharing. Now, do you have any favorite herbs or popular herbs that people should know about? Um, well, my favorite one is Atropa Belladonna or Deadly Nightshade. Well, that's the one that I Ooh, bring up the most. <laughs> love that. Yeah, so she's kind of been the, the guiding force on this entire journey for me. Um, and I think is it is one, you know, it's Deadly Nightshade, so, and it's the poison path. So, of course, it's going to be one that everybody kind of, like, gravitates to and gets excited about. Uh, but, you know, even something as as simple and common as tobacco um, and just as as versatile as a, a magical ceremonial plant that is for, for different offerings um, can be a really, you know, beneficial one to use or to work with, but it also has kind of that that baneful side or those poisonous associations. Um, and whether we consider it as like through kind of the misuse of taking tobacco out of its original context, and now it's, you know, being rolled into cigarettes and causing addiction and cancer and all of these sort of negative effects, um, sort of re- reimagining, re-understanding our, our relationship with that, and kind of getting back to a more grounded and and spiritual use of that plant um, tobacco is also in the nightshade family um, technically poisonous but not you know as dramatically poisonous as as deadly nightshade or datura wow and what are some of the other like accessible plants that we we can easily find and work with like around the world um i would think probably one of the most accessible would be black nightshade or bittersweet huh. nightshade. Uh, mm. It's it's still in the nightshade family. So Solanum nigrum, um, Solanum dulcamara are just kind of commonly growing, almost like what we would consider weeds. Um, but they do yes. have a lot of those kind of baneful Saturnian properties without being, um, you know, super, super poisonous. Yeah. Speaking of weeds, I just realized that sometimes plants just show up when you need them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I saw a beautiful flower grow in the parking lot of my building last year. And I'm like, oh, that's, I'm very curious about it. So I scanned it with my little app and I found it was like considered to be a weed called the Asiatic day flower. It was a beautiful purple flower. And I just sat with it. I meditated with it. I created an elixir out of it. I took it. I loved it. And I, and I use it year after year now. But do you find that sometimes poisonous plants just show up 
for certain reasons? And how can we start working with the spirit of that plan when it show us, shows up in our lives, whether it grows somewhere or whether someone suggests it or we see it somewhere and we feel called to it and drawn to it? Yeah, it seems like as soon as you sort of shift your attention to the poison path and kind of being open to that wisdom that they do start to pop up. Um, you know, a lot of them are very eye-catching, just like with Datura and the really large trumpet-shaped yeah. flowers. Or uh, here in Florida, we have a lot of angels' trumpets, the brute manzia, yes. which is, you know, even even more dramatic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just kind of being around and, and being nearby, like these, they're master plant spirits um, connected to a lot of important sort of beings and entities all around the world. Um, and I would say that the the Daturas and Brugmansias are, are probably the most kind of ceremonial, ceremonially significant plants um, on the planet, um, because we see them being used in India, in South America, North America, um, the connection to like the European witch's ointment. Um, so that's one that seems to pop up all over the place as a shapeshifter. Wow. And talking about the, the witchcraft aspect of plants, how can we work with them for magic or for rituals? Um, I create a number of different ritual formulas. Um, so actual ritual oils or um, essentially the same thing, a flying ointment, which would be just a more solid form of an oil. Um, and people kind of get hung up on how to work with them and how to actually apply them. And what I tell everyone is to just use them in the same way that you would use any other sort of magical formula, um, you know, putting it on your wrists to have some of the vibration with you throughout the day, if like for whatever the intention is, or using it as an anointing oil on a candle. Um, so we're really just kind of limited to our own creativity uh, when it comes to you sort of working with the plants magically or carrying them in charm bags and, and different sympathetic approaches. Yes, I'm excited. And um, I'm going to include all the links to all, all that you create in the show notes below so that people can browse and access all your, your magical products. Thank you so much, Kobe, for coming onto the podcast. You opened up my world in a completely different direction. I'm so excited to, to explore more around like poisonous plants. Can you please share a little bit about where people can get the Poison Path Herbal and where they can get in touch with you and work with you? So the Poison Path Herbal is going to be available at most local bookstores. Uh, you can also get it on Amazon or on my website, poisonersapothecary.com. Uh, best way to get a hold of me is via social media at Poisoners Apothecary. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more and taking a deep dive into Poison Path mythos you can connect with me at patreon.com slash poisoners apothecary as well thank you so much for coming on to the podcast Kobe. have a lovely rest of your day pleasure thank you